722, so good morning, good afternoon, good midday, everybody. Welcome to my class, Grounds of the Renaissance. And without further ado, let me go to full screen. All right, a little bit about myself before we go on. We'll go on. I am Lord Robin Carrot. That's my short name. That's my working name in the SCA. My bardic name is much longer. I won't uh, subject you to that. But I am uh, a resident of the Barony of Bjornsburg in the most stellar kingdom of Anstiora. Um, I am a bard, I am a musician, I'm a composer, and I am also a voice herald, a little bit of book heraldry, but not a lot. I am currently the court herald to the Baron and Baroness of Bjornsburg and the Golden Staff Royal Herald to their majesties of Dora. I have been playing in the SCA for a little bit over three years, um, but I have been doing music ever since middle school, officially high school, uh, bandian, bandian down to the core. Always love marching band. Always love wind ensembles. I can't help it. It's it's genetic. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm currently the music deputy for the Kingdom of Anstiora and the secretary for the Anstiora Music Collect Musicians Collective. So that's all I have about myself. If you have any other questions, please feel free to ask at the end of the class. Now, what are we going to learn today? We're gonna to learn some extra special spiffy stuff. We are going to learn what a ground is. We're gonna learn how they were used in period. And we're gonna learn what were some of the most popular types of grounds that were used during uh, the time that grounds were used. Now, before we go anywhere else, let's discuss what a ground is. Now, when I say grounds, I know I'm showing you wonderful pictures of the most wonderful creation ever created, coffee. But I'm not talking about coffee grounds. I'm not talking about ground beef. I'm not even talking about grounds for a lawsuit, thank goodness. I am talking about musical grounds. And essentially what a musical ground is, it's a type of baseline. And that's all I'm gonna really tell you right now because in order for you to really understand what a ground is, you need to understand what ostinato is. So ostinato is basically at its easiest, sheerest form. It is a musical phrase that persistently repeats itself in the same voice at the same pitch with the same rhythm. Now that is the strict definition. That is the textbook not accounting for modern creativity definition. If you listen to modern examples, they may not follow that example as strictly, but for our purposes as lovers of music, studiers of music, we are going to say ostinato is a musical phrase that is persistently repeats in the same voice at the same pitch in the same rhythm. If you want to remember this, remember the English word that comes from the same word as ostinato, obstinate. And what does it mean to be obstinate? You're, you're unmoving, you're persistent, you're unchanging, just like the musical feet, the music we're gonna be listening to today. Now, what are some modern examples um, of music? Um, for, since, for, since some of us are at different places in our musical knowledge and musical study, I like to make modern connections to keep everybody in the same place. So what are some musical examples of ostinato? Who likes Christmas? Who's heard the carol of the bells? That is a modern example of ostinato. Dun, 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 You're welcome for that earworm, by the way. Another example, who here remembers the, who saw the movie Peter Gunn? Okay. Well, if you haven't seen the movie, you're probably familiar with the theme. Dun 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 another example of ostinato. Okay. Any fans of the 70s disco scene? Okay. 
If you're familiar with Donna Summers and Gior, Gior, Giorgio Mor, Moroder's I Feel Love, that's another example of ostinato. And last but not least, I have to make sure I list this one correctly. The Rolling Stones, The Last Time, that back melody rhythm that was, I thought it was sampled, but it's actually stolen by the Verb Pipe Bittersweet Symphony. That is another modern example of ostinato. So now that you've got in your head modern examples of ostinato, let's hear some period versions of ostinato. So the first one we're going to look to is Summer is a coming in, which I'm sure you've heard many, 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 many times, uh, especially if you've had a very long career in the SCA. Uh, funny recent story, by the way. Um, since I have been exiled for the good of our kingdom, I have taken up the hobby of watching classic movies. Uh, not very classic, just whatever I can get a hold of on uh, Amazon Prime. And I recently, well, not recently, but within the last year, saw the movie The Wicker Man, the good version, not the Nicolas Cage version. And um, it was a one, I was enjoying it. It was wonderful. It was great. And before I had seen the movie, this was like one of the happiest songs I have ever heard in my life. Then I saw the very end of The Wicker Man, spoiler alert, um, and everybody starts singing, summer is a coming in, loudly sing ooh. And without too much of a spoiler, I can now not think about summer is a coming in without thinking about the ending to The Wicker Man. <laughs> but without further ado, now knowing what we know about ostinato, let's listen to a period example one of the earlier ones of ostinato. All right, I won't be playing the whole musical sample just for sake of time, but I want to play just enough to where you get the idea of the ostinato that repeated sing coo coo, sing coo coo, and even the melody itself is kind of ostinato in a in a way and fashion also. But that is one of our earliest examples of ostinato. Moving on into the 1300s going into the 1400s early renaissance we have and i'm going to try to say this correctly resvelon nu amero revel of lovers by guillaume dufay so i found an example of this uh to show for you but i'm gonna play the first part the first part is what i want you to really listen to for the ostinato Though after the first part plays, which is just instrumental, then the people actually sing. And you hear the same thing that the instruments play, but you can hear the ostinato a lot clearer in the instrumental part than you can really in the voice part. So without further ado. Thank you. 
I'm sorry. Every time I hear Guillaume Dufay's work, it makes me so jealous because I'm studying composition <laughs> and I want to write melodies like that. And he does this thing in his melodies where the melody is very mysterious sounding, very ethereal, and it goes on and it does this raise up. And I think I've almost got it. I tried to simulate it one time. And it's one of those things that unless you study it really intently, you're only going to get it once. But this is another example of ostinato. You can hear it more in the bass. Um, with the way that it's structured, the melody is the top part. It's what you hear the women. The men are singing that ostinato bass line that is repeated again and again and again to the end of the song. So this is another example of ostinato. And with a more late period example of ostinato, we have the bells written by William Byrd. Now, the example you're going to hear of this one is not, uh, it's a more modern, um, it's a modern trans, uh, transposition. They took the original and made it for, um, I can't remember, oh, I think it's more for brass choir, like brass instruments, the brass ensemble, or it's for a wind ensemble. I believe it's for a full wind ensemble. But it's essentially still the same music. You can read along with the music if you can read music, and you'll see it's still the same melody. Now here, what you're going to notice is that the ostinato changes. It's not the same ostinato uh, motif from start to finish. It'll start with one, change, and it'll variate. This is another common feature of a lot of period music is the establishing of one melody and the melody changing and variating as the piece goes on. So without further ado, let's listen to the bells. Okay. Now, again, even though it's not exactly what you see on the screen, you still hear that ostinato, that repeating of that, of that motif that's introduced first, then it changes. And then also what you have in this example is a nice layering effect. This is almost like um, the world's most popular wedding song. Does anybody know what the world's most popular wedding music or song is in the United States of America? Take a wild guess. Um, it's a cannon. Yes. Pacha Bell's cannon. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. If Think about Pacha Bell's cannon and compare it to this. Don't they sound a bit similar? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cannons are kind of ostinato-ish in a way, but they're a little bit different. They come... There are cannons in period, but they are mo they're more known a little bit later in the Baroque era. Now, a little bit of a question time, a little bit of a thought provoking thing. Even on the, aside from the fact that writing with an ostinato is very beautiful and can give a very wonderful effect to your music, why would you think composers would use ostinato in their music? Rosa, go right ahead. Uh, just the repetition would be easier for the masses to remember to uh, if they're singing along. Exactly. If you're writing a song, a repeated motif will get stuck in your head. Think of every popular pop song you've ever heard. <laughs> 
repetition is a thing started in the started very early in our musical history and is still with us today any other reason think about it from the composer's point of view it's a cheap easy way to get texture uh right to have to have like carpeting underneath the main melody exactly it's an easy way to write a piece because keep in mind if you're one of the big top composers of 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 period um you're not just going to write one song and then just rest on the on the on the restitution and money you get from it you're going to be writing song after song after song after song and something is eventually going to give <laughs> creatively. So you kind of want something that you can maybe whip up very easily, very quickly and show it to your patron and make your patron really, really happy and still get the dividends. Okay, just a little thought provoke, little thought provoking during the class. Uh, any questions so far? Wonderful, great. Now, so we know what a ground is. I mean, so we know what ostinato is. Well, what is a ground? Well, a ground is a form of ostinato. A ground or a ground bass, or as it might be known also, uh, obstinate bass or basso ostinato. It goes by a lot of names, but we're going to use the Elizabethan term, which is a ground. Okay. Uh, a ground is basically a bass line. And right now with the period that we're going to be focusing on, which is the late 16th century, early 17th century, the ground is going to start off as a bass line made according to a formula that will eventually develop into a chord progression. Now, what is the difference between a bass line and a chord progression? A bass line would be just following a formula and creating a series of notes, like a little under melody, like bum, 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 bum. That's a bass line. But if I take that bass line and make it into chords, which are three or more notes played together, then we have a chord progression along that bass line. But that comes a little bit later. Right now, we're just sticking to a bass line. And it's a bass line that is made using a formula. Now, one thing I do want to get across is that a ground is a type of ostinato. Not all ostinato are grounds. Mm -hmm. You know, one is true one way, but the other way is not true. Okay. So now that, so now that we have that, also, with the uh, music we're going to be listening to and that we have listened to, as you've already noticed, a lot of our music it's very layered it has parts it has lines especially if you're dealing with more than one voice or more than one instrument so on one good way to think about music in respect to a ground bass is like this delicious piece of cake i'm going to assume it's delicious because i haven't had cake in a while and i really want cake so i am going to assume this cake is delicious <laughs> don't tell me different <laughs> think of this cake cake's layers as the top part being the melody and the accompaniment. The bottom layer would be your ground bass. This would be what your lower voices are doing to keep everything moving and supported. And the melody just lays on top of it to add interest. Because even though bass lines didn't really become interesting and a thing on their own until recently, before they were there for support and for grounding the, the, the melody and the music. So think of music like this, like a layer cake. And depending on how ambitious you are, this might be just a simple song in the country. Uh, in the court, you might have a tiramisu going on. <laughs> so think of music in along, those, along those lines as we continue in the class. Now, how were grounds used? Well, grounds were used primarily in two different ways improvising and composing now put yourself in the mind of a top musician during the elizabethan era you are paid to play a party yay you're getting money to play at a party wonderful great and all of a sudden the lady of the manor comes to you and says oh 
can you play a Passamesso Moderno? Now, you may not know a particular Passamesso Moderno, but you're lucky because she did not specify a specific Passamesso Moderno. She just said, can you play a Passamesso Moderno? And you just happen to know what a Passamesso Moderno is. If you don't know, I'll tell you, don't worry. We're getting there. <laughs> All you would have to do is know the formula for a Passa Meso Moderno, and you can improvise on top of that. So if you're a lute player or a vihuela player or any string player that can play multiple lines at the same time, all you would have to know is that baseline formula, and you can improvise a melody on top of that, and everybody has a wonderful time, you get plenty of gold pieces, and you've made everybody happy. So that is how they can be used for improvising. But not everybody is a wonderful improviser. I'm not. Unless I'm doing a bardic performance, I can't improvise worth a darn. So, <laughs> so some of us need to sit down and plan what we're going to play. <laughs> and this is where composition comes in. Now, what I have in front of you is the cover of the sixth book of dances uh, by Pierre Atania, and I hope I'm saying that right. You know, you always got those words you only read, but you've never had to pronounce. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> this is his sixth book of dances. And if you look very closely at one of the titles, you have a Pavan Passame. Passame is another way, well, Passames is another way of saying Passameso. And Passameso is one of the grounds we're gonna be looking at in detail. And the Pasa Meso was the baseline for a lot of pavans and galliards in period. A pavan is like a slow stately dance and a galliard is like a slightly faster dance that is usually partnered with a, with a, with a Pasa Meso. Mm -hmm. um, also, you'll see other forms of music here. You have the, um, the brawls, which there's a class later on brawls. The, and also with brawls, they'll have different types. You'll have the brawl de Champlain, the brawl gay, the brawl simple, um, different types of brawls. But we're not too much focusing on brawls because as far as I know, brawls didn't really utilize some of the common um, grounds. Mm. Now, 74 loop pieces. This is a manuscript that has been documented and saved that I managed to get for free 99 off of imslp.com. If you want period music and you're like, well, I don't know where to get period music, go to this website and have a good time looking at free period music. Okay, it's free. No excuses, people. There is music out there for free. <laughs> And if you look here at our listing, we have a Pasa Meso Pavan, a Pasa Meso Galliard. We have green sleeves. Fun fact about green sleeves, it utilizes two grounds. In the first part, it's a, it's a Pasa Meso Antico. We'll talk about that in detail. The second part is a Romanesca, and we'll talk about that in more detail as well. Uh, in case you're wondering what Queen's Mary's dump is, it's not what you're thinking. That is another type of ground referred to as a dump. The Spanish pavan is another type of ground. Um, the jig, the jig is not really a ground, but it's a type of dance. Also, we have a jump. A jump is another ground that that is another type of dance. And oh, look, if you look here, we have a bergamasca. This is going to be the first ground we talk about today. We also have the, cre the queen's ground. We also have uh, a flat pavan, which may use a ground. Another la vecchia's pavan, which might use a ground. Fall galliard, which also might use a ground. Oh, Robin is to the green wood gone. No, here. But I am bonnie and sweet. And sometimes I do wear a hood. <laughs> mm -hmm. So looking at these this listing you can see all of the pieces of music that obviously utilize grounds or that could possibly utilize a ground we won't know unless we play it and look at it mm -hmm. and also here for the choriarum moliorum collectiania 
published in 1583, is another list of dance music. And here, if you look over at the column on the right, we have a Passamesso di Italy. We have a Passamesso Moderno, so we know exactly what that is. We have a Passamesso de Angleterre. Uh, in case you're not really sure what these are, this is a Italian pas this is a Passamesso de Italy, a Passamesso Moderno, a Passamesso of England, a Passamesso of a place called Anures. Uh, it was a very popular convention to name a lot of your music after places or people. <laughs> And sometimes after a popular song or give them a fun title or name, it was really common. But again, we have more evidence that these grounds were used as the basis for compositions. And if you go and hear them and look at them and to analyze them, you'll see the ground melodies for yourself. So what are some examples of these grounds? I've been talking about these grounds for over... Uh, about 20 minutes now. Can we actually look and see what they are? Uh, of course, yes, but we have to talk about a little bit of music nerd stuff before we go on. Because I want to make sure everybody, despite your musical background, understand what we're talking about here. So, melodic progression. All that means is how a series of notes progresses from beginning to end in a music. It's like, think of your music as Little Red Riding Hood. Where does Little Red Riding Hood start her journey? At Grandma's house. No, at no, Grandma's that's house. Where that's where it ends. Yes. I, I went the wrong oh, way. Oh, I'm sorry. At her mother's house. Her it mother's ends house. At her grandmother's house. So think of your melody like, like Little Red Riding Hood. She starts in one place, ends at another. And whatever happens in the middle is her progression. That is how music progresses. Now, what is a chord progression? It's the same thing, just chords. So what is a chord? <laughs> a chord, like I said earlier, is when three or more notes are played together. Now, I put two here because I personally consider two or more notes played together as a chord. Technically, you will look in text and it will say two notes played together is a dyad. But for our sake, I'm going to consider them chords, and I'm just going to go back and correct it later. But that's what a chord is. So the dyad is a type of chord. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank it's you. Because I'm thinking dyad, triad, and you go up from that. So it is a type of chord. You're right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because I thought I was right, but they keep presenting my material. Present them as something different. Thank you very much. Who was that? I can't see everybody. Delphina. Oh hi. Okay. <laughs> and we will talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what is a major chord or minor chord? Okay. When you play a chord, let's say you have a range of notes going from, for example, C to C. If you play the first note of that musical group, which is C, and you play the third note of that musical group, which is E, and you play the fifth note of that musical group, which is G, if you play those exact notes, the white keys, you get a major chord, which is basically, um, they're spaced apart in a way to where they're, and they sound happy. Easiest way for me to explain this is that major chords sound very happy. A minor chord is almost the same as a major chord, except they're not evenly spaced out one of the notes the third usually is flattened and it gives a sadder more grave sound so without going into too much of music theory major chords are happy minor chords are sad so kind of just keep that in your mind that's how they'll sound to you now also note in chord progressions uppercase letters denote a major chord and lowercase letters denote a minor chord and if you're not sure what i'm talking about you'll see right now. So first, let's talk about the Bergamask. The Bergamask is going to be the easiest and simplest chord progression you can have in period music, because all it is is a series of four. So look at our note range here. We're going to go from F to E. So we're going from any F on a piano keyboard to any E on a piano keyboard. Excuse me. 
just straight up the white keys. If we go from the first note to the fourth note to the fifth note back to the first note, that is what creates our Bergamasque melody. Now, I need to point out something because I know somebody is probably going to catch me on this. You cannot in period music, and you can a little bit more today, but you got to be careful how you do it. But in period music, you cannot go from an F to a B. You can't do it. That is forbidden. You can't do it. You also cannot play an F and a B together. That is forbidden. You can't do it. They actually have a name for that. It's called the devil in music. Long story short, when they were formulating the system of music, they noticed that without doing anything, if you play an F natural and a B natural together, it gives a horrible sound and you haven't augmented really anything. You haven't flattened it or sharpened it. You just play them together. They sound naturally bad. So it is known as the devil in music. And what do you have? What do you have to do? When the devil is present anywhere, those of you who've been watching movies since the 1970s, especially horror movies involving little girls who vomit green stuff, what exercise. Must you, do? you must exercise it and you do it by flattening the B. Okay. So this B here is actually a B flat, but I didn't, I don't have a little symbol like here. It's noted in the music, but not here because I didn't want to confuse people by putting a little B with a big B and confuse them. So if we go F, B, C, F, F, B, C, F, one, four, five, one, one, four, five, one, you have a Bergamask bass line. That is a Bergamask bass line. And what does this sound like? That is your Bergamask bass line. Now, the Bergamask you heard is not exactly the same as the Bergamask you see on the screen. You don't have to always go back to the same F. You can start on one F, go up to the next F, or you can go down to another F, as long as you're going to the F, in this case, as long as you're doing that. So now that you know what the Bergamask is in detail, and you know what it sounds like, let's hear an actual exact did not tell you to play. Let's hear. Let's hear an example. Sorry about that. But before we hear an example, I do want to point out that in my research, I found out that the burlesque is a popular chord progression in modern music. And it's actually present in a form of music you probably wouldn't be aware that is part of. Can anybody guess what type of music uses the, the Bergamas chord progression? Rap? No. Rave? No. Think a little bit older. Think colors. Bluegrass? Oh, you're close. You're very, very close. Country. Blues. <laughs> Blue. Like Lua, Lua. Yes. Uh, Stando Bar Blues is basically a variation of the Bergamas. And other popular songs will use the Bergamas chord progression. So there's another modern connection for you. Now, let's hear an example of a Bergamas. So again, I won't play the whole thing for the sake of time, but I wanted to play enough for you to hear that bass line. So if you listen closely to the bass line, as I said at the beginning of class, with these examples, listen to the bass, you're going to hear that bum, bum, 
bum, bum, bum, bum, bum, bum. And then that melody is going to be just placed on top of it to give interest and, and um, melody. So let's play it one more time just so you can hear it if you didn't catch it the first time. <clears throat> There's your your example of the Bergamask. Any, any questions so far? All right, wonderful. Let's keep going. Now let's talk about. Okay. The, hold on a second. Okay. Uh, microphone turned up really loud for a moment, and it's doing feedback. So you might want to. Knock I just it turned it down. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just turned it down. It does that a lot. Okay. And I just heard it just turn it down immediately. Sorry. <laughs> if I play music right next to it, it does that. Let me move the microphone back a little bit. Can you everybody turn still hear me? Turn it down more. Okay. Are we good? Nope. Nope. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. It's not getting softer. It's not getting softer. It's not getting softer. You're not adjusting. Whatever you're adjusting, you're not adjusting the microphone. <sighs> Seriously? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let me pause the recording as well. All right, okay. after about that, I have moved the mic a foot away from my mouth, maybe a little bit more than I turned it down. So hopefully that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, let me know you're ready. Have we started recording again? Okay, all right. So now let's talk about the Pasameso. Now, the Pasameso, as I mentioned before, is probably one of the more commonly used bass lines uh, in period. As a matter of fact, it's so commonly used, they made two types. So you have the Pasameso Antico and the Pasameso Moderno. Translated for ease of knowing what the heck these terms mean, the old Pasameso roughly and the modern Pasameso roughly. So with these two, we're going to start with the Pasameso Moderno because it's very similar to the Bergamasque. And the reason why I say Similar to the Bergamas. If you again look at our note range going from G to F, if we go from G to the fourth note, C, back to the G, and then to the D, we now have a Passameso Moderno bass line. We go G, C, G, D, G, C, G, D. One, four, one, five, one, four. One five one. Now, listen to how it goes following this formula. Okay, so. You can tell it sounds a bit, it sounds similar to the Bergamask, but it seems a bit more structured. There's a little bit more structure with it. It's just not one, four, one, four, five, one, one, four, five, one. It's a little bit variated, a little bit more structured, but it is different. Now, also, this is another common chord progression used in popular music. And without further ado, I that is going to happen a lot, apparently. Okay, now, Diego Ortiz wrote a, wrote a book called Tratado de Glosas in 1553, which contains different examples of the Pasamesos, both Pasameso Antico and Pasameso Moderno. So we're gonna hear both. We're gonna hear two examples, a Pasameso Antico and a Pasameso Moderno from his works. 
And again, remember, listen for the baseline. Okay, so if you hear in the part, you hear that bum 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 bum. That is the Pasameso Moderno. It sounds. Oh, actually, I'm not going to tell you how it sounds. You tell me. How does it sound to you? Does it sound happy, sad, excited, angry? So oh, it sounds happy to me. It, it sounds happy. Uh, what about the Bergamask? Happy, sad? Sadder, but kind of indifferent. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I'm happy, but I don't care. <laughs> well, good, good ear, everybody. The reason why these two sound happy is because they're using major chords. They're using major chords in the chord progression. So they're very happy sounding chord progressions. Um, Unfortunately, the Prozac won't last too much longer. <laughs> because now we're going to go into the Pasameso Antico. Now, the Pasameso Antico is a little bit more variated, but it's commonly used. Most of, from what I've studied, most of the Pasamesos that you'll, you'll hear about in period music are mostly Pasameso Anticos. Now, if you look at the chord formula, You'll notice that, oh, we're starting to have little, little eyes, these little lowercase eyes. Does anybody remember what that means? Minor. Octave. These minor. are minor chords, yes. So we're going to start off with a minor, continue to a minor chord, and we're going to get a minor. So a little bit of a... Um, Yes, it's a little bit of a guess. Do you think this is going to sound as happy as the Pasameso Moderno? No. No, probably not. Let's hear how it sounds. You were right. It does sound a little sadder, a little bit darker than um, the Pasameso Moderno. Uh, the reason why I say dark is because there is a term used in early music uh, scholarship where when we add a flat or a sharp to music, it's referred to as coloration. <laughs> so that's why we'll hear people say sometimes, oh, this is very dark sounding or oh, this is very light sounding. It comes from coloration in music and very, very early on, and it still sticks with us today when we talk about music. But this is a very grave sounding, a very kind of more or less dark sounding chord progression. So now we're going to hear, that's not what I wanted to hear. So now we're going to hear from the Resercada Primera sobre el Pasameso Antico from the Tratado de Glossia. So this is the Antico from the same source as the Moderno we heard before. Remember to listen to the bass line.
So there we have an example of the Pasameso Antico. And without further ado, we now are at the Romanesca. Now, the Romanesca. From what we've this from what we've learned so far about the Bergamask and the Pasameso Antico and the Pasameso Moderno, and if you're looking at the basic chord progression here. Do you notice anything familiar about the Romanesca? Hmm. Okay, I better do it. Uh, the D and D. The D and D. The uh, four and five. Okay. Oh yeah. What about the four and five? Uh, they don't play the nice together. Yeah, so they probably are not going to be present. Okay, but what do you notice about the progression specifically? The seven to one to five, the seven to one to five, what do you notice that's different from one we've already looked at? High, low, or low, high, low, high. Okay, high, low, low high. high. I'll tell you what, let's kind of backtrack. So here's the Pasa Meso Antico, one, seven, one, five, three, seven, one, five, one. Now let's look at the Romanesca. Do you notice a small- Is it the same? It's mostly the same, except for- the three at the beginning. Except for the three at the beginning. The Romanesca begins on a major third instead of a minor first, like the Pasameso Antico. So it sounds like this. Okay, so how does this sound to you? A little darker, a little lighter than the others, or about the same? Darker. It sounds more minor. Okay. Also keep in mind that um, sometimes changes in the note grouping can affect it, but also adding flats and sharps will also affect color as well. Okay, so for our last example of a ground, here we have an example of a Romanesca. Again, listen for the bass line. Okay. And there we have it. Four of the most commonly used grounds of the Renaissance and Elizabethan time period. Are there any questions or concerns about what was taught in the class today? All right. Sorry, I had my mouth full, but I do have a question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, I have talked to other harpists who play early music and they'll say well i just play the ground 
I never really knew what that meant when they said they played the ground. I didn't know if it meant they were improvising a bass line or if there was something set. So if you're playing in an early music concert and I say, okay, you're playing the ground, is it generally written out or you just say, oh, I know this is a Romanesca, so it's going to be X? Um, it, both. It depends on the situation. If you're a musician who is not that familiar with the ground, it would probably be very helpful to have it written out for you. But if you're like one of those super awesome early music scholars who's like, oh, I know this by heart, you can just, you know, rip a tune out without it. You don't need it. It just depends on the musician. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when they say they're just playing the ground, it's usually you don't know the you don't know the melody or the music that well, but you can play that bass line, which is essentially what you're doing when you play the ground. You're playing the bass line. And that's what they opt to do because it's simple, it's no fuss, no muss. I think I think that people often use it um, not technically to mean ground, but just the bass that I'm just playing bass chords. I'm a harpist too, so um, yeah. It, yeah. It also depends on the situation. If they're in a more modern setting, they'll just say, "Oh, I'm playing the ground," meaning I'm playing the bass. But if it's they're actually playing a ground ground, then it can mean that also. It again changes with the situation. Um, also, let me go ahead and. Post in the chat before I forget, because, hey, I do that from time to time. Um, I am going to post in the chat the link to the handout if you would like it. So I just copied it. I it find that it's very useful for improv improvising. So if you're doing improv over a song and you want to change it somewhat, you may change the ground underneath it to give it a little more texture or less texture. And I find that I kind of hear these now that I know them, I know what name they have. <laughs> yes. And also keep in mind that I'm just presenting the, the examples I'm presenting before I play the, the actual period example are just to get you to hear the basic sound of what the ground sounds like. Composers would divide it up into instead of whole notes half notes quarter notes eighth notes variate it make it a melody unto itself um even if you know it might be writing in counterpoint and they might want to variate it to make it its own melody they're not as they're not always as plain as i'm presenting them in class a lot of them would variate them and change them up to make them more interesting Any other questions? Just comment. I appreciate the preparation that you took to put this class together. Thank you. This is thank the second time. Oh, thank you very much. This is the second time I gave the class and I'm trying to up my game. And I realized the first time I taught it, I didn't have many musical examples. I'm just telling people about it. I'm singing this. I'm like, I don't have to sing it. I can download it and put it into the PowerPoint. <laughs> This was really enjoyable and you you covered such an amount of technical concepts in a really clear way. I feel oh, like at the end I understood it all. So yeah. Thank as, you. As someone who you know is not uh, musically uh, adept, uh, this was very, very helpful. As always, I it's always learning marvelous things in ways that I can understand it. Oh. So the examples were excellent. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. And I'm glad you're all saying that when my Laurel is right here in the classroom. So <laughs>